but I do feel something. I feel something that's like a presence. It's, it's, uh, I can almost say that it's like an instinct, but it's a power that I don't tap in that often. It's, it's a situation that I don't tap in that often. You know what I'm talking about? And it's something that we, we sort of like know now. We know that when we go to prayer, we don't have this feeling. We know that we don't feel right in our prayer. It's like when we were singing just a second ago. If our hearts not engage a certain way, we don't have this indescribable feeling, or this instinct, then we feel that we're not necessarily engaged or connected as we should be. It's not what we see. It's that feeling. And I have to be careful about this because... Uh, some people may even ascribe the feeling closer to emotionalism. And I want to make sure that we know that we're not talking about emotionalism. We're not talking about the senses of, of feeling or feeling guilty. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something that you just cannot contain. It's abstract. And you can't put it in this bottle and say, here, when you close your eyes and pray to God, you should get what's in this container. You can't do it. But it's here in your heart. I remember her look when I told her that. She seemed that. She seemed pleased. She seemed as if she understood what I was saying. Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? When you think about visualizing God, when you think about hearing God, we often think about the thought of it, senses. We think about the ear and its reason for being here. To hear. Hear words. We think of when we think about the voice, we think about the voice box. When we think about voice boxes, I'm sure we think about different types of, of individuals who have recognizable voices. I can mention some names that you'll say, yep, recognizable. I was watching a Disney program, and that's why I mentioned Mickey Mouse. But if Mickey Mouse were to stand way back in the back and just speak out, and no one turned around, you would visualize. Mickey Mouse. I, I, I don't believe that. You know, there are other people that have distinguishable voices. I love comedy. So I'm going to touch this one person. If Kevin Hart walks in the door, stands there, and starts speaking, you would recognize his voice automatically. It's just distinguishable, recognizable. And more personal, more personal, I bet you someone very close to you, very close friend, a parent, if my mom were to call me right now, like she did in the past, boy, it wasn't Kurt, it was boy. <laughs> and amongst all the chaos and noise and distraction, I heard her voice. I recognized her voice. I knew I better do what she just said. I knew that. Recognize her. We have these voices in our lives that we can discern quickly. And it's to our benefit that we do. It's all around us. In our workforce, we start to recognize our boss's voices. We recognize our boss's nuances, don't we? We recognize these things. The same with our family and our neighborhood. I think that we can discern God's voice, too. Now, I already said, I'm not talking about the ear. I am talking about the voice, the power that comes from this voice. Stay with me a little longer. I want you to think about some biblical evidence that back the claim that you can hear God's voice. Plenty of them. You start in the book of Genesis, and you know that Adam and Eve had that personal relationship. God talked directly to them, walked among them as well. You know, Cain also had that interaction with God. God speaking directly with Cain, and uh, Cain speaking directly to God. All of this happened in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden. And we move forward. We know that the Apostle Paul had that time with God as well. He had that holy time. Some say it's the voice of Jesus. Some say it's God's voice. But I'll say it's the holy time where he recognized God's voice. Stop. He was affected immediately. The Apostle Paul. Then there's patriarchs that we are studying in, in our New Testament Wednesday class. People like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They heard the voice of God. And 
By the way, Moses heard the voice of God as well. So, I mean, we can just go on and on and say, well, there was no kings that heard the voice of God. And I beg to differ with you. Absolutely. There were kings that heard the voice of God. King David comes to mind quickly. Then there are prophets. And the prophet's role is to be the messenger of God. You would think that as a prophet of God, that they heard the voice of God. And my discussion of voice focuses on one of the strongest, one of the most uh, steadfast prophets of that time. Actually, of all time. And that's the prophet Elijah. Elijah is very, very popular, even to this day. That considering uh, who are the great individuals, great leaders of the time of Israel, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Those are the three. But Elijah, he had quite a wonderful life in God, living with God. And the first thing I mentioned to, to you is that you know how much I love Enoch, because I love saying his name. But he's one who was taken up, had not experienced death. But Elijah was the second person who did not experience death in the history of mankind, or of humanity. Did not experience death. So I want to consider a couple of key factors as we continue forward. The first, first thing I want us to consider is the fact that Elijah had choices. That's the first thing. Hold on to that as we talk about Elijah, the, the synopsis of Elijah's life. He had choices throughout his lifetime to do this or not to do this, to comply with this or not to comply with that. I'm going to point a few things out. The second thing is Elijah had opportunities. Choices and opportunities. That's a power. That's very potent. You give a person the opportunity to excel, that person who is motivated to excel will more than likely excel. You give a person choices, that person grows in wisdom. That person grows in being steadfast and loyal and committed. <laughs> choices and opportunities. That's what we need to think about as we think about Elijah and his life. See, he chose to be the intercession. He chose to be the prophet of God. He could have said no. He could have denied it. He could have said, no, I'm not going to do this. It's too much for me. Especially during this particular time where he was living at. He could have said, no, it's not me. It's too much for me. You see, that time was very difficult in the life of the Israelites. It was very chaotic. You had royalty, the people in charge, that were worshiping false gods. And to the point in which the king and queen, the king really wasn't the power, the power was the queen, Queen Jezebel. And the queen was pushing her religion on the Israelites, and they were not pushing back. And so they had, they had all kind of signals of who they worshiped, of these false gods called asterisk poles highest places. And so they were worshiping them. It was not a good time. And I say to you that because we often say it's not a good time right now in America with all these divisive things happening. Can't agree on most anything. And then there's other things that we disagree with that we also often sometimes tend to take people's lives. And then bring it closer to home. <laughs> Don't drive down the road and have a disagreement with somebody. You might be a targeted for road rage, and you might end up in a bad, very bad situation. My mind have life changed, and it's more confrontational than ever before. That's what we teach our kids, and that's what we teach our grandkids and our loved ones, is how to be safe in this unsafe environment. It's not that much different now and then. But Elijah chose to put on the cloak as a prophet of God. Despite all the problems in the world, he decided not to be persuaded, to turn away from God, but he elected to follow him. Our first reference comes in the first letter of Kings. And if you, if you will, just put your thumb on 1 Kings 17, 18, 19. You'll breeze through that. And breeze through that rel rel relevantly respectfully, 
while hitting the key points. Elijah had choices. Elijah had opportunities. In 1 Kings 17, in one it states, Now Elijah the Tishbite, from Tishbe in uh, Gilead, said to King Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Again, the situation was bleak. It was so bad that there was a drought that God uh, allowed a drought to occur in the land. There was a shortage of water. There was a shortage of food. People were starving. People were were uh, thirsty. Things were rough, and things were tough. And it was because of leadership, because of monarchy, because of the king that was allowing others, allowing the queen and others to worship false gods. And God said, that has to stop. I shall send my messenger to tell them there shall be no more rain or anything even close to water until I elect to change my mind. Now the king, he he wasn't uh, the kind of king that was going to make a decision and have everyone no longer worship the false gods. After all, he had a big problem. His wife, the queen, was worshiping those false gods. So who wore the pants? I can probably tell you respectfully that Queen Jezebel had a lot of say on what happened to these people. (laughs) And she wanted to continue to press for the people to worship these false gods. Well, because of that idolatry, sin was flourishing. Because of that, it was sin was surmountable, unsurmountable. It just continued to grow. It was a tough time for the people. But Elijah decided to continue to do what God asked him to do, was to speak to the people, to bring them back. Let them see that the the best way to live is to live for the true and living God. The only way to have life is to have it from this true source, which is from the true and living God. And Elijah put his life in jeopardy, jeopardy in speaking to them. Is it much different than today? Do people harass individuals because of their beliefs? Do people give people a hard time because of their commitment, their statement, their loyalty to God? It happens today. And it happens increasingly, over and over, beyond harassment beyond emotional harassment, but into the physical. As a mouthpiece for God, I need to be clear. Elijah had the choice. He could have said, no, I'm not going to be a prophet. Not only that, he could have made the choice to say, nope, I'm not going to tell that king nothing. I'm not going to say a word. Appreciate you telling me this, God. I'll just keep this to myself. Reminds me of another character in the Bible. You guys remember the character named Jonah, who decided that he would rather get swallowed up by a well than go to Nineveh to tell the people to repent. That was Jonah's choice. That was the wrong choice. Elijah made the right choice. He decided to tell the people. He decided to tell the king. He took advantage. He seized the opportunity. What does that tell us? tells us about opportunities that are faced every single day. We can either seize it, embrace it, hold it, utilize it, make good use for it for the king, allow it to just be squandered. Moment of complete silence. No action, no voice, no word. Another confrontation is written in 1 Kings 18. Turn over to 1 Kings 18. And we talked about this before. I'm just going to mention it. We talked about when he confronted the false prophet of of Baal at Kama. And he told them, why don't we make a couple of things here, a couple of of altars, one for your, your God and one for mine. And he gave very specific 
instruction on how the altar is to be constructed. And he said to the Baal, Baal uh, prophets, hundreds of them, he said, Yell to your God. Let him strike that and take up the offerings. Nothing happened. He said, you know what? Yell louder. And you can imagine how they were just probably yelling, popping their voices, and nothing was happening. And he went to them again and said, you know what? He must be asleep right now. Yell even louder. And they did. Nothing happened. And he prayed a simple prayer to God. God took up the altar that was designed for him, but he also took the altar that was designed for the false god. <laughs> the story doesn't end there. You see what happened after that is that now in verse um, verse 40, Elijah says, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let even one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the wadi Kishon, and slaughtered them there. The story doesn't end. All the prophets of Baal was killed by Elijah, by Elijah's word. All right, stop for a minute. How, how do you think the queen felt about that? Oh, joy. All right. We got newness in the know. She was upset. Look what she said in 1 Kings 19, 1 and 2. Now, King Ahab, here it is person with the power go into the person with the real true power. He told Queen Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger directly to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. What is he saying? He's saying, I got you. I'm going to take you out. You're next to my list. <clears throat> and by the way, she even gave a deadline. There's no place for you to run, no place for you to hide. By this time tomorrow, you're, up. you're history. Elijah fled. He hid in a, in a cave. And while he was in the cave, he showed his vulnerability. And oftentimes when we are confronted with, with things like this, we can't hide our vulnerability. When we have these intense challenges in our lives, our vulnerability comes to the top. And then we not, not only have to deal with this particular issue, we now have to deal with that vulnerability. In this case, Elijah's vulnerability is fear. He's afraid. And he knew that the queen had a, a great deal of power. Now, this fear impacted him in a deeper way. It made him feel uncomfortable. He made him feel helpless, hopeless. He felt that what he was doing within the kingdom was futile. Was it worth, was it worth his time? Was it worth being subjected to a possible death sentence? from the queen. All this floating in his mind and heart. He felt alone. He felt inconsequential. Can we relate to that feeling that Elijah experienced? Yeah, true, we feel really good when we have those victories. <coughs> the Eagles won yesterday. Felt good. <laughs> but boy, when they lose. I, I just go to another team. <laughs> but when we have our balance in our lives, that's when it really stays up with about our, the core of our being. Who are we as a person? Are we strong enough to deal with those situations? Who are we? And it floats to the top. And you can't hide. It's like the time that we reach out to speak to someone about being saved, and they call you every name in the book. They don't listen to that important message that you have. They listen to you about most other things, but that, no, they won't. And you start to feel the, the pain when you're being rebuked by these individuals. It's that time when you pray to God for relief, to help from your struggles and your internal conflicts. 
and you see nothing but darkness. And because you see nothing but darkness, you feel that his presence is not with you. And you feel that this is just a cycle of nothingness. And like Elijah, you feel inconsequential. And then the matter is worse. It seems like nobody cares. Nobody's paying attention. Nobody recognizes the struggle that you're going through. Especially if you're one that has been someone that everyone can depend on. But now all of a sudden you're just feeling down. Trump downtrodden. And now you're the one that needs help. Who do you go to? I think that we should now pivot and speak about God. You see, God had something in store for Elijah. When he went through the ups and the downs, when Elijah was going through the great times, but now going through the challenging times, God had something in store for him, just like he has something in store for each one of us. When that vulnerable time comes into our lives and we feel like there's nowhere to reach out and grab and hold for security, but God has us. He has something in store for us. You see, God dealt with Elijah's need. God spoke directly to Elijah. 1 Kings 19. This is very interesting to me. 1 Kings 19, 11 through 18 says this. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind, it tore through the mountains apart and shattered the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his head, over his face, and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Do you see it? You know what? When I'm guilty of this, is I look for something mighty, something substantial, something big. I want to see something big. I want to see a little mouth. I want to see something big. I want to see that God uses mighty force. The mountains shall move. Not just the cloud. I want mountains to move. That's what we expect from God in our lives. We want the big things. But then God gets us to move in the gentle things. That whisper is powerful. Think about someone whispering and what they're saying. They're communicating. But it's, it's the softness. It's the calmness that brings that gentleness. And it eases our mind and our spirit and our being. The power that's in the fire and the earthquake. That gets my attention. But notice Elijah recognizes that the voice is not that. The voice is in the gentle whisper. That's what we seek. Isn't it? We seek the gentle whisper. He saw the voice. He heard the voice many times. But it was through the whisper that Elijah his life was rejuvenated. His life was restored. Do you see that gentle whisper? Parents in here know the power of that gentle whisper. You're trying to get someone's attention and you say, clean your room! I wish you would clean your room! And you find out that the harsh words just doesn't move a person to act the way you want them to act. You sit down and you talk to the young person Usually gets the person to come in. I hope you see it. You see, Elijah was down, and God lifted him up with his voice. The voice gives us power, gives us strength. The voice empowers us to make decisions, to make good choices, to recognize the opportunities, and then seize the opportunities to glorify and honor our Father.
God gives us that. He gives us that moment by moment. You exercised that earlier today. You made a choice to be here or not. That's the power of God whispering, saying, do this. We depend on you. We need you. I need you to praise me. I want you to praise me. You need to praise me. That's the power in that whisper. I want to make one more point and then I'm going to close. And that is God speaks to us through the plain and the simple. Something as devastating to the natural landscape as an earthquake or fire or the just a simple and something plain. And when we look for God to make changes in our lives, do we look for that big thing? Or do we look for that very plain and simple thing? I've got a couple of examples for you. The scriptures, this whole the word, plain, simple. Read it, understand it, love it, embrace it, change, allow it to change your life. It's God speaking through his holy word. Holy Spirit, it dwells in, in every believer. It's to be the conscience of the person. To speak unto us, knowing that we have choices. And that conscience within our spirit, called the Holy Spirit, helps us, guides us. If we let it, because the decision is still ours. We decide what to do with those, those, those inputs. Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, plain and Earlier I mentioned an example of those who heard the voice of God. And I want to mention that there were many who heard God's voice through the actions of Jesus. Many. Multitudes of individuals who heard his voice. Heard the voice of God. Walked with God. Touched God. Was touched by God. The voice resonated when they heard his voice. And it power was so potent that it Caused them to change their life forever. Take note that Jesus came, he came like a whisper. He didn't come with a sword all drawn out. He didn't kill all the false prophets within the land, but he came with a whisper and talked to people about the kingdom of God. That is Jesus, our Lord and Savior. I'll talk more about Jesus in the in the coming weeks. And Jesus came in the flesh. He provided us an avenue for repentance. He provided an avenue for us to have reconciliation with God. And reconciliation with God is so important. When we have a fight with someone we love, we want to have reconciliation with that person. We don't want to always not speak to this person, avoid this person, stay away from this person. We want to eventually rebuild, restore our relationship. And that's what Jesus provides, that bridge, that Bridges that relationship, that, that connects that gap between personally you and God, between us and God. That's what Jesus does. We began this lesson on John 4 24. <coughs> I want to close with it. It says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him. In spirit and in truth. And we can get bogged down and locked in the fact that God is spirit, and we can say, well, how do we worship someone in spirit? What do we do? I mean, I can't see. I can't feel what's left. How, how do I worship him? And the scriptures say it's not intense on that feeling, that emotional high. It's not on the mental thought as well. But it is about the total submission surrender of our lives to God. To be a warrior for Him. To be a messenger just like Elijah. To make the choices just like Elijah made. Our biggest choice is whether we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's our biggest choice. The opportunities today, tomorrow only. Nobody knows but the Father. And the day after that, nobody knows. But today, this moment, this opportunity is ours. God made it. Gives to each one of us. 
We either seize it or let it go. We make a choice. God wants you to make that choice. No longer you need a world. and plain as it relates to us. He does not want things to be so hard that people can't understand it. I got a couple more verses in Galatians, the second chapter, verse 19. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. back to the comments about total submission, complete surrender, it is Christ who bought us, who lives within me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Angie would say right now, oh, that reminds me of a song. She loves somebody's song. <clears throat> Are you hearing the voice of God? Not here. Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 17 states, So then faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Reading, understanding, growing, learning. Finally, I'll say this. As I offer the invitation for those who want is that this church opens up for Bible study on Sunday morning, study the word together. It's not just for me personally. It's so that I can help others grow. It's about helping others. And the question could be asked, is it I see what you've done for you. But what have you done for others? Have you helped others along the way? How have you helped others along the way? This church also opens up on midweek, on Wednesday. We come together. We even have it on Zoom where you can Tap into the Zoom and listen to uh, the comments. Uh, worth your time. Absolutely worth your time. Big, big part of growing in Christ to do it together. Not just for me, but for others. If you have a need today, first of all, you have to hear the voice of God and say, please, Surrender. Give your life unto me. Believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Repenting. Deciding for no longer I'm going to live worldly, but I'm going to live for God. Confessing that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Being baptized, which means to be cleansed. And given a brand new opportunity from that moment on. There are other steps. But for now, for now, your need is, we are all here to encourage you and assist if necessary. Roger's got a song selected that's called the Invitation Song, and once he sings that first note, you're more than welcome to come forward and I'll listen to your plea, and I can articulate that if necessary. Or if there's other actions needed, we can do that as well. Be sweet I know. Once we start singing, please come. This is a time for you to make the right and to live for God. Come on, can we sing this song? Peace, sweet, I know.